All right, if you will turn with me in your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 20. I've been saying for a while now, we are eventually just going to pick up pace and run through these Proverbs. And this time I mean it. So strap in, here we go. A lot of verses in this chapter. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 1. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. We're going to have to stop there. (laughs) Here we go. Is drinking a sin? I get this question a lot. (laughs) Is drinking a sin? Lots of opinions. Lots of disagreements. This is one of those arguments where people tend to pick a side and they line up with everybody else who agrees with them and then they lob grenades at the people on the other side. Let's settle this once and for all. Because I get to, like I say, I get this question a lot. Let's dig in and see what the scriptures say about this subject because that's all that really matters. We've got plenty of opinions. We've got plenty of arguments. We've got plenty of, of ideas and thoughts. But the scripture often makes those null and void. Amen? There's a way that seems right to a man. But its way ends in destruction. Let's settle it. Let's dig in. See what the scriptures have to say. For those of you on the it's okay side, here's your ammunition. I'm going to load you up. Okay? Here's your ammunition. Jesus' first miracle was to turn water into wine. Okay? Yeah, he did. And it's doubtful he would have done that if drinking that wine would be a sin. That would seem a little odd, wouldn't it? Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 5, no longer drink only water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities. See, Timothy was abstaining completely, and they didn't have Pepto-Bismol back then or, or any, of that, any of that stuff. And Paul is saying, hey, look, I, I get it. You're, you're trying to, to make sure that nobody thinks you're drunk, and that's fantastic. That's trying to be righteous. You're, you're, you're in front of these people, and you're young, and, and you've got a lot of detractors who say you're too young to handle the position of, of leading this congregation. But, hey, you've got to take care of yourself. So, Timothy, drink, drink a little wine. Don't just drink water. And he said that immediately after saying the very previous verse to that. At the end of it, he says, don't share in other people's sins. Keep yourself Keep your shelf. Keep yourself pure. Let's try that one again. <laughs> Sounds like I've been drinking, doesn't it? <laughs> Guess you just found out which side I'm on. <laughs> That's not funny. Stop. <laughs> exactly. In the previous verse, he says, Don't share in other people's sins. Keep yourself pure. No longer drink only water but use a little wine for your stomach's sake. Paul also references the subject in teaching about the responsibilities of those in church leadership. And and the the overseer position, which we would call a bishop or a pastor or or some people would call a reverend, and that that just crawls all over me, by the way. Don't ever call me reverend. (laughs) I am not to be revered for anything. Let's get that straight. In that position, he says, the overseer shouldn't be given to wine. That's the phrase, not given to wine. And so at first glance, that kind of seems somebody who doesn't participate in the taking in of wine. But you've got to do the word studies. It comes up again right after that. The ministering servant, in, in the Bible they, they call that the deacon. We, we would use the term elder um, around here. But, but really, I, I think it's anybody who's in any uh, kind of, uh, of leadership of, of any of the ministries here. That's the, the kid church leader and the uh, women's ministry leader and the men's ministry leaders and and the elders all of those folks it said the phrase in that teaching says well that in the list of qualifications said well they shouldn't be given to much wine so the overseer shouldn't be given to wine the others shouldn't be given to much wine in both cases even though there are different words there for given they seem to point to somebody who tends to get drunk Somebody who doesn't have control over that. Not somebody who drinks. Now having said that, I'll tell you what I've decided. For me, as the overseer here, I don't think drinking is okay for me. I don't. 
no matter how poorly I speak on Sunday morning. That's, <laughs> I promise you that is not the cause. <laughs> I'm just not a good speaker. Here's why. Later in that list of qualifications for a pastor, for the overseer, it's a long list of qualifications. <clears throat> At the end of it, Paul says, this is in 1 Timothy 3, 7, if you want to check this out later, moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Not given to wine seems to mean, hey, you shouldn't mess with that if you can't control it. But if I want to make sure that I have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest I fall into reproach and the snare of the devil, it may not technically be a sin for me, but it sounds like a really bad idea to me. Something absolutely unnecessary that might cause a problem. And it's something I don't want to play around with. I have no use for it. If it's important to me to be a voice people will listen to so that I can share the truth about Jesus and Scripture, then I need to, be, need to be seen as trustworthy and in control of my thoughts and in control of my actions all the time. If somebody sees me having a drink, then that gives the enemy a chance to plant a seed of doubt to my character. Especially these people outside, they don't know me. If you were to see me taking a drink, it probably wouldn't concern you because you have spent so much time with me, yeah, I guarantee none of you have ever seen me drunk. Somebody that doesn't know me, looking from outside, they might say, oh, man, I, that's odd. That doesn't seem right. And I may never get a chance to speak to them. And uh, also, some of those people are going to be the ones who straight up believe it's a sin. And I'm certainly never going to get the chance to speak to them. So for something completely unimportant, I might take the chance of losing access to a lot of people. And for something totally unimportant, unimportant I might lose the chance to share something really important. And so again, I'm just not going to mess with it. I have zero interest in going anywhere near that potential problem but to get back to the point at hand here if you're in the it's okay camp it would seem that there's some scriptural evidence for you to turn to to get the full picture concerning any topic mentioned in the bible though we need to look at all the references to that topic from the bible not from all the teachers not from all the commentators not from all the websites because i don't care what you believe you can find 20,000 people on a website that strongly agree with you and they can bolster your opinion. Let's go back to the Bible and see what it says. A great resource for this. I talk about it all the time. Openbible.info. Go to your Google machine, type in openbible.info and pull up this website and you can do a topical search of all the verses of the Bible. And what I like about it is, uh, I've said it before, it's not a keyword search. If I put drinking in, and search that it won't just look for the word drinking and give me all those verses it's a compilation of all the verses that that as far as it knows correlate to that topic or that subject so when you do that and you put drinking in in openbible.info just a few examples here it gives a long list okay exhaustive but just a few here ephesians chapter 5 verse 18 and do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation but be filled with the spirit in 1 Peter chapter 5, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Now that word sober there, it doesn't just mean serious and focused. It actually means abstain from wine. See, there's a little glitch. And all we had to do was a little bit of study and just dig barely underneath the ground for that nugget. That word, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. That word sober means abstaining from wine. In Romans chapter 14, it is good neither to eat meat nor drink wine nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. And since Solomon was the wisest man ever to live, and since it is his proverb that has led us onto this trail, let's look at what he has to say. Obviously, we see it right here. He already said, wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. Now, where he really gets into it 
is chapter 23. I'm going to just go ahead and cover that now, and we'll, we'll skip it when we get there in six or seven months when we get three chapters, <laughs> when we get three chapters ahead from where we are now. <laughs> but that's where he really hits it. So, so flip over to Proverbs chapter 23. Let's just deal with this now. Verse 29. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaints? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? Those who linger along, those who linger long at the wine. Those who go in search of mixed wine. Do not look on the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around smoothly. At the last, it bites like a serpent and stings like a viper. Your eyes will see strange things and your heart will utter perverse things. Yes, you will be like one who lies down in the midst of the sea or like one who lies at the top of the mast saying, they have struck me, but I was not hurt. They have beaten me, but I did not feel it. When shall I awake that I may seek another drink? Wow, that's quite a different view of the life of a drinker than you'll see in the magazine ads or on TV commercials. We were talking about this at a meeting we had the other night. Man, you watch a beer commercial, man, you're like, I got to have that. I could look like her. Wow. Look how much fun they're having. And there are never any side effects. They're never angry. They're never bitter. They're never depressed. Look how much work they get done. They work all day and then they go drink. And then the next day they get up and they work out and then they go to work again. That's just awesome. Anybody ever have that experience by drinking a lot? Let the record show. No hands. <laughs> you know, we supposedly we have these truth in advertising laws. I don't know, man. I want to see the next morning. I want to see the 3 a.m. shot. Not the 8.45 at night shot if you spent much time with people who have given themselves over to drinking you know it's a pretty accurate picture that Solomon paints here it brings nothing but woe and sorrow and confusion and pain people drink it to feel better and to have a good time and yet it's a depressant the enemy is so good they're fooling us into doing things, choosing things that will harm us. It's amazing. So some of the scripture references, it's fair to say, is it, is it fair to say, after looking at, at all these scripture references, is it fair to say the following statement? Drinking alcohol in and of itself is not necessarily a sin. Is that fair? What about this one? Drinking alcohol because it makes a provision for the flesh could be dangerous because it's something a person can lose control of. Yeah. After all, its job is to take away inhibitions. That's what it does. That's what it's designed to do. And sometimes inhibitions are all that keep idiots like us out of trouble in the first place. <laughs> inhibitions are not a bad thing. But beer and wine tell us that they are. You need to be freed up. You need to loosen up. You need to stop worrying so much. You're too uptight. You need to relax. Well, I'm all for relaxing. But when you relax your mind, well, you can get into trouble. And that's what this is designed to do. I'm constantly amazed by we take things that are designed to do something specific and we assume they won't necessarily do that. I deliver gasoline for a living. You would be amazed at the amount of people that smoke while they are filling up their car with gas. And whenever I see that, I look at him and I say, you understand that stuff is designed specifically to explode. That's what it's made for. You get that, right? Yeah? <laughs> okay. I'm like, hey, I'm ready to go. <laughs> I'm with you. <laughs> it just blows my mind. They just look at you like, yeah. Same thing with drinking. It helps me. It calms me. It unsharpens your mind. That's what it does. Isn't it true that there isn't a one-size-fits-all answer to the question, is drinking a sin? 
We've just said it's not necessarily sin, and we've also said it's horribly dangerous in many cases. Isn't it true that to answer absolutely yes or absolutely no, you have to avoid some Bible verses? See, and this is the kind of thing that, that makes me nuts. When people take a hardline stance on something, and there are verses that clearly say, well, maybe not necessarily. If you ever want to see this in action, go look at Calvinism versus Arminianism. Okay? Each one of these strong theological camps have a long list of Scripture that backs up their version of the truth. And it is 100% correct, taken in context, um, um, divided rightly. You can't argue with the logic. The only problem is the opposing view has the same scenario. They have a list of verses totally in context, totally true, totally rightly divided. And that means what they think. The problem is they tell each other they're wrong. Well, to do that, you have to avoid some of the other verses. Let's just take all the verses and put them together and go, I can't understand that. Okay. That's all right. Instead of arguing with one another, which we'll get to a little later, we are going to get past verse 1 today. I think. Instead of of taking it all and putting it together and going, okay, let's try to make it fit together. And if we can't, we know it does because the Bible is inerrant and God is perfect. So I guess we, our mind just can't fully understand that. So let's extend grace to one another and say, we can't absolutely say this or this with a full understanding because all of these things on the list are true. Grace and mercy come into play there. And they have to. Right now, you're probably thinking, well, thanks for clearing that up for us, Pastor Kent. Appreciate it. He's drinking his in. Well, you don't know. Where does that leave us? Well, people like acronyms. So I've got one for you. Well, you also will fat. <laughs> Bless you, he said. Got to be careful when you're talking to thinkers. Well, you also will fat. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That's what this comes down to. The correct question is whether it's okay for you or not. We can't settle this one with an absolute yes or absolute no for everybody. It would appear that it's absolutely not a sin. Jesus made wine. Paul told Timothy to drink wine right after saying, hey, don't sin. So we cannot absolutely say that it is, but we also cannot absolutely say it's nothing to worry about. So what is the truth for you? That's what matters. And you have to think through that honestly, and you have to pray through that honestly and seek guidance. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of the Lord. I would say that I abstain because alcohol is designed to affect the way my mind works. And I want to be able to take my thoughts captive. And I want to be sober-minded, as Paul puts it. You might say, yeah, it affects your thoughts like depression and anxiety medicines do. What's the difference? I'm not sure. I'm not sure that there is. Or are you saying those meds are sinful? Nope. I'm not saying that. I'm saying you have to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You need to determine through speaking to your God what it is that he wants you to do with this topic. I know alcohol is dangerous because I've seen it destroy lives and completely take control of somebody's existence. I spent a decade of my life playing music in bars where what was being advertised was carefree, harmless fun and relaxation. But what was delivered was depression and loneliness and shame and regret. By the way, that's why I actually stopped drinking. It was way before I became a pastor. It was the realization that as much as I loved music and I loved playing music and I loved being with the musicians that I was playing with, I loved everything about that. You play around Nashville, you get to play with some amazing musicians. You don't make any money because there's 85,000 of them. And they're all willing to work for $20 a night. But you get to play with some amazing musicians. And I loved every second 
of that. The problem was I could see everything else in the room that was going on. And it was horribly depressing. And I finally realized that I was drinking quite a bit. Nothing dangerous. It was never out of control. But I was drinking quite a bit more than I had previously. But it was only when I was playing. And I had to go through that thought process. Well, why am I doing that? I don't even buy stuff to keep at home. This is just here. And I was running away from the truth. I was trying to get numb to what was going on out there so I could do my little thing up here. And the incongruency of that in my mind, which didn't want to realize that I was helping what was going on out there by what I was doing up here, is what I was trying to avoid. It was an escape mechanism for me, a defense mechanism for me. And I got really uncomfortable with that, and I stopped. So, on some level, is wine medicinal? Maybe. But I don't think you should trust scientists to determine that. Did you see the little video that's going around uh, Facebook the last couple weeks? Of the, it's got a couple sitting in a kitchen. And there's this time travel guy. He comes back from the future. They're like in the 60s or something, and he's in the, in the 80s. And he, he comes running in, and the, the wife has just made this big plate of eggs for the guy. And he comes running, like, don't eat that! Don't eat that. We just found out about cholesterol, and that is full of cholesterol, and you cannot eat that. And they're like, oh, thank you, and he leaves. And about 20 seconds later, because it just stays with them, so, you know, their time is moving at normal, at normal speed. About 20 seconds later, he comes flashing back in, and it's five years in the future for him. He's like, wait, 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 okay, we weren't, we weren't completely right about that. Uh, yeah, there's cholesterol in that, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that translates to cholesterol in you, so, hey, hey, just don't eat the... The, the one part, you have to separate it, and the whites and, the, and all that. He explains that, and, he, and they're like, okay, thanks, and he leaves. A few seconds later, he pops back in, and it's five years farther in the future for him. He's like, okay, okay, you know what? We were totally wrong about all that. Just eat your eggs and enjoy that. <laughs> so is wine medicinal? Maybe. But I think we should go with prayer and, and, and reasoning through the Scriptures to determine whether God wants that for us as opposed to listening to science because they are all over the place. I think prayer is in order. Well, you're also fat. Now, let me make it a little harder. What if it's okay for you, but participating might somehow cause a problem for somebody else? Maybe even somebody you're not even aware of. I'm always telling you, people are watching. They see what's going on. You have a sphere of influence you're not always even aware of. What if you embrace this drinking because it's not a problem for you and it's not a problem for your circle of friends? You can get together and have one or two. And it doesn't change the way you act. It doesn't radically change your personality. It doesn't affect you that way. And it does relax you a little bit and you can have a good time and then you can go home and you don't wake up uh, red-eyed or, or confused or having lost any time. All It's not a problem for you. But are there not a lot of people around that it's a problem for? Is this not a powerful thing in the mind of some people that they literally cannot control and every time we create a scenario where we are where we are lending credence to the concept of it's okay in moderation are we not possibly tempting them to do something they can't handle is that our responsibility to an extent yeah they're responsible for their decision, but I think we're going to answer for our participation in that decision. Our mindfulness, even, whether we're even aware that it mattered. Right after I started going to this church, this would have been in, in 02, 03, we, we had a young guy that was in our congregation. He was a rapper, and his name was Jeremy. He was fantastic. Okay? Good writer. Solid beats, good message. Love this kid. He hooked up with a couple other guys. They went out on tour. They're going all, all, all these churches on the East Coast. He comes back. I'm like, hey, man, tell me how it was. He said, oh, it was great, man, that we did this and this killed and this killed. This was awesome. This was fantastic. He said, there was this one place that we went to in Virginia. 
And he said, me and, and the other two guys, we all did our show, and then the crowd loved it. We were in like their big, huge fellowship hall, and, and it was a fantastic. It was packed, and he said, when it was over, the pastor of the church comes up, and he was like, hey, we want to thank J-Life. That's what he called himself. We want to thank J-Life and Ricky B and these other guys for coming out and ministering to us tonight through music. And so you, you give them the hand of friendship before you leave here tonight. You love on them. You tell them you appreciate them. And you got a chance to do that because now we're going to move over into the, the other hall here. And uh, we're going to have some fellowship time over there. we got some, some sandwiches and, and, and some, some barbecue and, and some of this and some of that. And we got some Coors Light on tap and we got Miller on tap. And Jeremy was like, what in the world just happened? I'm at a church and it's a keg party. This was a fairly large church. I can't imagine how many people were in that church who struggled with addiction to alcohol, who were at this event hearing the gospel from the music, and then the pastor says, okay, now go on over here into this room. We got some beer on tap for you over here. That's ridiculous. Now, that's the extreme of what I'm talking about. We're light and salt. We're intended to influence the culture around us. And we do. For the better or for the worse. Go to 1 Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter 8. <clears throat> Remember when we, when we talked through this before? This is Paul's used meat scenario. There were people struggling with, with whether or not they should buy used meat at the market because the, the false gods, uh, the worship of them, had people bringing meat to the altar of the false gods and they would burn it to their gods, but whatever was left, they would take it to the market and then sell because it's still okay meat. And so people were like, hey, we're Christians. Are we allowed to eat that meat? I, I don't know what to do with that. Is that okay or not? So chapter 8, Paul says, Now concerning things offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. And if anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing, yet as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. Therefore, concerning the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, that there is no other God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, of whom we, of whom, <clears throat> excuse me, of whom all are all things, and we for him. And one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we live. However, there is not in everyone that knowledge. For some, with consciousness of the idol, until now eat as eat it as a thing offered to an idol. And their conscience, being weak, is defiled. But food does not commend us to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, nor if we do not eat are we the worse. But beware, lest somehow this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to those who are weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will not the conscience of him who is weak be emboldened to eat those things offered to idols? And because of your knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. But when you thus sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, your sin against Christ, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never again eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. There's the heart of the follower of Christ. Is drinking an alcoholic beverage a sin? I don't see it. Is it an open door? Is it a provision for the flesh? That can possibly lead to all kinds of sin? To yourself and to others? Maybe even people you're not aware of? It is. And I don't think you can honestly deny that. Well, you're so fat. That's going to catch on. Are you setting me up right now? <laughs> Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. 
Boy, you also wore fat. For sure. So absolutely, we're getting t-shirts. Hashtag, hashtag boy, you also wore fat. It's a movement now. We're, we're going viral. All things are lawful for us. But not all things are profitable for us. We need to walk as those who are awake. And partly to protect those who are asleep. We need to be sober and diligent. Consider your way. Pray and live on purpose. What's the truth? From this amazingly intelligent man that gives us these proverbs, wine is a mocker. Strong drink is a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. How do you make sure you're not led astray by it? Same way you're never sprayed by a skunk. Go the other direction. Problem solved. Verse 2. Now we're going to pick up some steam. The wrath of a king is like the roaring of a lion. Whoever provokes him to anger sins against his own life. We talked about that last week. I don't even actually have to explain that one. Opposition to authority just because you don't like authority never ends well. Never ends well. Because it will lead you into rebellion of that authority without changing the fact that they are still in authority. So it's just not a good idea. And don't forget that the scripture says all that authority comes straight from God. So try to find a healthy way to deal with that. Verse 3, it is honorable for a man to stop striving since any fool can start a quarrel. This is the one I highlighted from this chapter. It is honorable for a man to stop striving since any fool can start a quarrel. This is a word in due time for us and for our country today. Especially after what happened yesterday. Words mean stuff. It is honorable. What does honorable mean? Glorious. Splendid. In the original language. It is honorable for a man to stop striving. What does striving mean? Disputing. Being an adversary. Complaining. Contending. Quarreling. Indicting. So to get the meaning of the verse, we go back to that original word. It is glorious, splendid for a man to stop disputing and quarreling and indicting and complaining and contending. But any fool can do the opposite. In our relationships with brothers and sisters and children, in our marriages, in our churches, in our political system, in our culture in general, I see something that's extremely disturbing to me. I see people who have an honest difference of opinion on something. Instead of doing with that what we just did with the concept of drinking, well, let's go back and find the absolute truth and see what we can determine from that. And if there is no absolute yes or no, then let's figure out a way to live together and respect one another and move on. Because if we can't determine this is an absolute yes or no from the scripture, it is not an essential. Because God is not the author of confusion. Instead of stopping and sitting and talking and listening and reasoning and seeking to be gracious and merciful and kind, that disagreement almost automatically becomes an argument. Arguments become name-calling and labeling. And once we've got everybody labeled properly, we start treating them as a member of that group instead of a person. And that's always been dangerous, but it's way more dangerous now with all the social media stuff. Because people feel free to say whatever pops in their little pea brain. Sorry, did I just label people? He 
People say things on social media they would never say to somebody's face. Never. And when they're gathered in groups, one group on this side and one group on this side, they say things to one another that they would never say if they were two people standing side by side on a street corner. And it ought not be so. Once we label everybody and put them in groups and there's animosity between the groups, then the groups just start hanging out together. Here's my people, there's your people, and there's those people. Here's the danger in that. All of a sudden, you're surrounded by people that only think the way you do. And it's nearly impossible to even hear anything from the other camp anymore because you immediately dismiss it. That's what drives me nuts about politics. I cannot fathom saying, okay, label me with this political symbol, and after that, I am going to agree with everything, everybody that else that has that symbol says and I'm going to disagree with everything that everybody that has the other symbol says that's ridiculous I would never make it hey, right is right and stupid is stupid I'm just no good at being two faced anymore the groups start hanging out together. They're emboldened in their view. They aren't even exposed to the opposing of you anymore. And then somebody decides, hey, we got to do something about this. And stuff like this always reminds me of that scene in Men in Black. Will Smith and what, what's his name? Tommy, Tommy Lee Jones. Where Tommy Lee Jones is explaining all the stuff about the crazy stuff that's happening that nobody in the world knows about. And they're protecting them from that knowledge because they can't handle it. Will Smith says, well, why don't you just tell them? People are smart. And Tommy Lee Jones' character says, a person can be smart. People in a group are stupid. They're like cows that are led wherever the leader wants to take them. So the groups get together, they hang out together, they segregate themselves from everybody else, then they, they get pumped up and they decide they got to do something about it. And then the mob, devoid of rational thought or moral boundaries, because that's what has to leave for people to do some of the things that they do. The rational thought and the moral boundaries are gone and they head off to shout the other side down and to make sure that they listen to nobody. And if they have to become violent to get their point across, they will. Because their goal is not to get along with anybody. Their goal is to push their agenda. And if you agree with that, fine. If not, get out of the way. That's their attitude. I've seen this in churches that have split over theological differences. It's amazing to me when churches split over things that are non-essentials. And one group leaves, and all of a sudden, man, they're just down-talking one another awful it's spiteful it's mean it's hateful i've seen in this in the differing theological camps on the bigger picture of the christian worldview they say nasty things about one another i've seen this in families i've seen this attitude between husbands and wives it becomes about well, who's going to win i am done listening to you i have to win and I'm going to do whatever I have to do to make sure I win. I've seen this attitude in the political conversations of friends, the media's portrayal of political views, the way political candidates treat one another, and the way they govern once they get elected. It's ridiculous. Yesterday we saw it again. Just one more time in a long list of stupidity. Irrational behavior. Mob mentality. It's happening more and more frequently, or at least we know about it more than we used to. One side of a difference of opinion becoming so angry they resort to hatred, leading to physical violence, even death. I'm just sick of it all. It is so against everything in this book. And I'm sick to death death of it and I'm even more sick when people 
take that view and try to put it on this. It's honorable for a man to stop striving since any fool can start a quarrel. That's how easy it is to avoid all this stupidity. Just stop. I'm sick to death of brothers and sisters in the church treating one another like enemies. I'm sick to death of one denomination treating another denomination like enemies. I'm sick to death of husbands and wives hurting one another as if they're at war with each other instead of Satan. I'm sick to death of politics being the strongest religion in this nation. It's the religion that we have that seems to command the most loyalty and the most passion, the most unity and the most division. And therefore, the most striving, the most indicting and judging and hating and disrupting and all the stuff that goes along with that word. I'm sick to death of people seeking victory over one another with no regard to the methods used, no regard to the hatred spewed, no regard to the lives lost, no regard for the God dishonored in the whole thing. I pray there's nobody in this room like this. I don't think there is. I pray that there's not, but if there is, know this. I hate what you're doing. I hate it with a passion. If these attitudes are in your mind and you're not stopping them, if you're not taking those thoughts captive and rebuking those in the name of Jesus and and seeking to be what the Bible says we ought to be, I hate that. If you are mean to other people, if you show hatred to other people, if you are condemning of other people, and you try to put the tag Christian on top of that, I hate it. With a passion. If that's you, I hate what you're doing, and I consider you an enemy of the cross, and therefore of me. I love you because that's how following Jesus works. Hate what you're doing. Hate what you're thinking. Hate what motivates you. Yesterday was the day for me to weed out some folks off of my little friends list on Facebook. I just don't have time for it anymore. I hate what some of those folks think. I hate what they do. I love them. If that's you, hate what you're doing, love you. I'll pray for you and not at you because that's how following Jesus works. I do not consider you to be the problem, but rather the devil who has blinded you and is working through you. So I hope and I pray for your eyes to be opened, but I will not continue to strive with you. I don't have time for those arguments that just never end. It's honorable for a man to stop striving. I choose honor. On purpose. And not to be a fool. Any fool can start a quarrel. Barack Obama yesterday, he quoted Nelson Mandela. Saying, no one is born hating another person because of the color of his skin or his background or his religion. People must learn to hate. And if they can learn to hate, they can be taught to love. For love comes more naturally to the human heart than the opposite. Dr. Ronnie Floyd, the former president of the Southern Baptist Convention, concerning what happened in Virginia yesterday, said these protesters do not represent in any form or way the Christian faith or the values followed, the values followers of Jesus stand for. In fact, white nationalism and white supremacism are anathema to the teachings of Christ, who called us to love and serve our neighbor, regardless of skin color, gender, or religion, to give up our life for our friends and to even love our enemies. As Christians, we do not tolerate or condone these protests. We certainly and wholeheartedly denounce any form of supremacism, anti-Semitism, or white nationalism that promotes racism, violence, or hate. I agree with that statement. Completely.
So here's what I would say. Concerning all the striving that is infecting our lives, all the arguments, all the bigotry, all the hatred, every other negative thing that seems to define our culture today, I reject it. I choose to stop striving. I choose to love God and love everybody else only. And whatever that turns out to mean, I'm okay with. Pray, read, do. I want to end with uh, a couple of prayers over this today. Um, Pete, will you come up? Michael, will you come up? Hunter? Mr. Suter, will you come up? I know you don't need this, but this is sort of real on the recording. Is this on? Okay. Okay, prayers over this topic for our brothers and sisters in Christ. The, the not striving, not letting arguments become hatred, the coming together instead of separating. And then... Yours would be for parents and kids and husbands and wives along the same lines. And yours would be for leaders of our country and wherever. All right, let's bow our heads. Lord, we just uh, pray today for this time in our, in our church, in our country, Lord, that we choose not to see the world as, as everybody else does, Lord. We want to see the world as you would have us see it, as you would have us act. Allow us to act towards one another the way that you have called us to, Lord, the way you showed us when you were here. Allow us to love one another, Lord, no matter who we are no matter what differences we might have, Lord. The only thing that is important is you, Lord, and, and your will for us. I just pray that we have some kind of revival in this nation, Lord, that we just turn towards you because you're the answer, and we know that. The world, unfortunately, doesn't know that, so allow us to be your hands and feet and and open others' eyes, Lord, and show that love as an example that maybe that'll just continue to move on and become a movement, Lord, that your love and your understanding becomes our will. In Jesus' name. Lord, you built the family, the mother, the father, the children, Lord, as a unity to represent how you wanted us to live our lives, Lord, that the husband would support his wife and that the wife would support her husband and that they would come together as one and support a child in your name, Lord. However, the enemy appears to have gotten into this plan, Lord. He has set husband against wife, Lord. He has set wife against his husband, her husband. Lord, that um, they cause such strife with each other, Lord, and as, as our pastor said, Lord, that, that one has to win, and they can't see that in winning, nobody wins, that to come out on top means that the other one was crushed, and how can we win by crushing half of ourselves? That is not winning, Lord. You are winning. Jesus is the definition of winning, Lord, and that in these families, Lord, we, we develop these, these thoughts of hatred towards other families, Lord, towards, towards those that are different from us, that, that stand. We separate them and push them apart, Lord. And you say in the word, Lord, that we are all one under Jesus. And, Lord, we separate them and we set them aside. And you say, yeah, well, you, you believe in Jesus, but 
you you don't believe in this and you don't believe in that and and uh, Lord, this is all not in your plan. Those are the Pharisees that separate them aside, Lord. Lord, you tell us that uh, in love we shall love our brother and our sister as ourselves, Lord. And that will never be succeeded through separation, Lord, through hate. Love is the exact opposite of hate, Lord. Lord, we pray against the spreading of this disease to the children, Lord, that, that the children would see this action in their mothers and their fathers, Lord, and that these babies are carried to these scenes of violence, Lord, where one group speaks violently against another, Lord. We pray against that, Lord. We pray that you would shade their eyes and plug their ears and not allow them to carry this forward. Uh, Lord, we just pray that these people, that all of us, that hold any viewpoint against another that is not of you, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you would separate that from us now, that you will cast it into the pit, Lord, so that we will never even think those thoughts again, Lord. Uh, Lord, we pray that the entire population of the planet, Lord, can come together under one cross, Lord, that we can be bound together under your blood, and that we can forever see only the joy and the love of Jesus Christ in our hearts and the world around us. Amen. Father, Lord, glory be to your name. Uh, uh, you're such an awesome God. And Father, I give you thanks. And Father, Lord, uh, I do pray for this nation. Um, God, I just pray that your will be done. Uh, I, I saw a bumper sticker just yesterday, Lord, and it said to pray for our nation and had a cross beside it. And I just thought, God, what do I pray for the authority? I mean, what, what do I pray? Uh, it's we're, we're a mess. It's, it's, it's terrible. Uh, and there's no doubt that Satan is all over this thing. Uh, but, Lord, I do pray that you would be the God that I know you are. And, God, that your authority, God, would reign superior over everything. And, Father, I know that every leader that's in authority is not called by you. I, I know that. And the Bible tells us that it's not. So, Lord, I know Satan has some people in place. And whomever they are, I know you're bigger. I know you're a stronger God. And I know your intentions uh, are good. But, Lord, I do pray um, for President Trump. God, I'll, I'll lift him up to you. God, somehow get a grasp, get a hold, get control over his mind and his heart. Lord, turn his mind and his heart to you. It can be done. Lord, I pray for some surrender in his life. I pray that you would just put some godly people in his path intentionally, that somebody would come up to the forefront and have a conversation with this man. I, I don't know, but I lift him up to you. And Father, Lord, I do pray uh, for the people in authority of the church. Lord, I lift them up to you as well, God. That's, those are the people I know that, that I can pray for, Lord, and, and I know that maybe just maybe um, we're on the same page. But, Lord, I pray that any good, Lord, and I know that any good that's going to come out of any of these situations is going to have to be from true believers. That's the only good difference that can be made. I, I don't think evil is going to make a good difference. I, I don't think any of these uh, white supremacist groups or any of these uh, oppositions to anything and violence is going to, that's not going to bring anything good. The only good that can come is going to be from true believers. It's going to be out of love. And love, if we, Lord, if we strive at anything, let us only be for the sake that we're striving for the cross. Lord, that, that is my heart, that your people would know uh, that our business is your business. We want to be about the Father's business, God. 
And Lord, it, if that means suffering, if that means taking blows, if that means I don't know what that means, other than the fact that I choose to love. And I choose to obey you. So, Lord, turn your people's heart to you, God. Let us be the difference that people will see. and people. Let us be the difference that this, this country would come to say, come to know that, 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 that we are the difference, that it, and it can be. Uh, and, and, and at some point, this, everything will calm down, and, and we'll all take, get a little easy. But we have to stay in the fight, God, with love. We, we, we don't get to take breaks. We don't get to chill out in this thing. So, Lord, let us, let us make a difference. Lord, and I do, again, I pray for those in authority, Lord. Just, just have your way. Lord, and I, and I thank you for Kent. I, I thank you for his heart, and I lift him up to you as well, Lord. He, he's our authority in this church, and we will pray for him, God, and we will hold his arms up, and we will stay in this fight together. Father, I love you. I praise you in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Thanks, guys. <clears throat> Last night I went back and I listened to uh, Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech. You ever listen to the whole thing? First eight, nine, ten minutes or so, he's talking about the severe problems, the real struggles, the honest anger and discontentment at the situation in the country that he saw. But the answer he saw, which is the part that, that everybody focuses on, which is just the end, is the I have a dream part. And that, that answer that he gives is guided by faith in God and his principles. Hope. It's all about hope. There is a difference that can be made. Hope for a coming together, a, a, a hope of being united in purpose, a hope of moving forward to create a reality that would be radically different, radically better. If you're a follower of Christ, I'm assuming you have experienced that personally in your life. In, in, the, in the Bible, we see the stories where, where whole cultures were changed because of faith in God. There's nothing that is impossible. I don't think we have much time left, but I don't know what that means. So let's not just sit patiently and wait for the, the glorious nature of our eternity, let's, like Mike said, let's be about the Father's business until that time. That's an opportunity that we have to make something radically better. Whether that's our church or the church in general, whether that's our relationships with one another, with husbands and wives and kids and brothers and sisters, whether it's in politics, if you're going to be a part of that, that political um, um, banter, conversation. Do it the way a Christian would do it. We can be different. Let's be different. Let's be better than who we used to be. Let this be our attitude. They will know we are Christians by our... Thank you. Any fool can start an argument. Followers of Christ bring peace, honor, mercy, and solutions. Always. Amen. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this teaching today. I thank you for giving us a heart to search your scriptures and find truth that will impact us here and now. And I pray that it does that. I pray that we leave here more focused, more energetic, more um, at peace with who we are in you and not uh, considering our position in society or culture. Who cares about those things? But Lord, wherever we find ourselves, whatever group somebody else may have labeled us as, let us be followers of let us be those who seek to do your will so that you can work through us, so that you can do miracles through us, so that you can change us to the radical extent that others want that. And Lord, I pray for revival in this country. Start it from the ground up. Start it right here. Lord, start it with us right here, right now. If that's what we want, there is nothing that can keep that from us. And I just pray your will be done. Bless your people as they go from here. Let us be light and salt this week in some way let us feel your presence and your power flowing through us this week and let that give us courage to speak in authority with all grace and all love and all mercy the truth of the gospel of jesus christ in jesus name we pray and everybody said amen, amen. love y'all